Uh, good morning, church, wherever you're at. Come on, let's worship this morning, amen. I hope you got your singing pajamas on this morning because we're going to do a little bit of singing. Well, I raise a hallelujah in the prayer. 
presence of my enemies. For I raise a hallelujah. Oh, Lord, have any your belief. For I raise a hallelujah. For my weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Oh, heaven comes to fight for me.
to grace when my heart is on the fire. Another way when the walls are closing in. And when I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning.
Good morning, Argo Christian Fellowship. We are so happy that you have tuned in with us this morning to worship. Uh, we are so excited to have you. And uh, one quick announcement. We are looking forward to the chance where we are able to meet together as a family again. And as of right now, uh, even though these times are still really confusing and we don't know how our government's going to react and we don't know what our local government's going to do or uh, what the rules are going to be tomorrow, uh, we are looking for May 31st, that Sunday, of being our first Sunday to be able to get back together and it's going to be our uh, 9 a.m. service. We're going to meet out here underneath the pines, right outside the church. And we're going to invite you to come and worship with us that day, to be able to meet. And uh, we may still, um, we're still going to practice that social distancing, but we're still going to be able to come together and meet as a family and, and have that worship service right outside our church here. Um, it'll uh, be to bring your own chair. Uh, we're not going to have um, any food or drinks or to help us keep everything sanitized and, and things like that. But uh, And if you are high risk and uh, you don't feel comfortable, we are still going to be filming our 1015 service, and that'll be online. Uh, we're going to continue that uh, from now on. We've just seen um, a lot of fruit come from being able to, to have our services online. So if you can't make it to that 9 a.m. service, uh, rest assured we'll still be here um, on Facebook Live for you. I'm going to invite you to uh, open God's Word this morning in Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to read the first seven verses of chapter 2. I'm going to ask that you would read along with me. It says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions, passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Church, I ask that you would just reflect on that. That's a beautiful passage, um, and it's one that we're going to finish up in, in the sermon uh, today. But just to, to think about where we were, and then we see in verse 4, it says, but God, and that's such a beautiful pivot in, 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 the, in our story. And if you're a child of God, if you're a new creation, you're a Christian this morning, that's a part of your story as well. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you would just let that truth of that miracle that you have done in each and every one of us, bringing us back to you, or that that might fuel our heart to worship. Father, I pray that our meeting this morning and, and having Jerry uh, deliver the word that you've given him and, and us studying your word together, Father, that might draw us closer to you, to love you more, to want to glorify you more, to want to share and be transparent about the change that you have made in us, to make us want to go and share that with others more. Father, we ask that your word would just transform us. Father, we ask that you would just remove all distractions from us this morning, allow us to fully focus on you and what you have to say to us this morning. Father, we cannot thank you enough for salvation and for the for the continuing of, of just blessing us, right? So, Father, this morning we ask that you would just humble us and, and give us that focus. Allow us to, to worship you well. Father, not to leave this morning unchanged. In your son's name I pray. Amen. Good morning. It is great to be with you again this morning, church family. I pray that you're doing great and that you've had a great week and you're ready for another great week. 
as you uh, serve the Lord, our God, and as God continues to mold and shape you into the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. This morning, we're in Nehemiah once again, and we're in chapter 6, so you can get your Bibles ready and turn to Nehemiah. Remember, we had said that uh, the story of Nehemiah, it began actually uh, back in Ezra, so you can read these two books together, and I encourage you to read through this story and read through the rest of this, this great book of Nehemiah. There's just so much here. Uh, before we get into today's message, um, I've got to announce to you that congratulations are in order. Ryan Cochran, the man that was just up here, he just finished his undergraduate degree from New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. So we want to give him a big hand and a shout out. He did great. Uh, he finished uh, with flying colors and there was um, a lot of hoopla. I think he got an email that said congratulations um, and that was about it. I don't know if he'll get a card in the mail from the school or what or maybe his diploma at some point, but uh, we are so happy for him and congratulations to him. Well, Nehemiah chapter 6 is where we are this morning. We're going to read a lot today. We've got to read this entire chapter to get an understanding of what is going on now in our story of Nehemiah. First of all, um, we're, going to, we're going to see today, as we've seen already, but we're going to see it in, in just very, very clearly in these few verses that we read, that Nehemiah had to continuously choose to trust God despite what was going on around him, despite what everybody else was doing. He had to continuously choose God. When, when the people were not happy, when the people felt like the, the work was too great, when all of these things were going on, when the enemy was attacking for over and over and over again, he had to continually trust in God and choose to trust in God. You know, our lives today are built around a uh, short attention span, and it's like we are um, conditioning our next generations to have short attention spans. It is always wonderful to, to, to me to hear of somebody having a, a library card, and they like to go and read books and, and uh, do those kinds of things, but um, because our, our lives today are not built on the long term, they're built on the short, little intervals, whether it be a 15-second commercial or a three-minute blog or fast food, faster food, or even good food fast, uh, sometimes you find that, but um, life is reduced into minute and second intervals, and Nehemiah is, is chosen to not, not be distracted, but to stay uh, focused and to have resolve for the long haul. He was absolutely committed. Because we, we find out from him that things of value require time and they require focus and dedication and effort. And that is what Nehemiah has. That's what he does. And that's what makes him uh, be able to get to this point in our story where he accomplishes what he had set out to do and what God had burdened his heart with. And that was to rebuild the walls. Well, let's begin reading in chapter 6. In verse number one, it says this, Now when Sanballat and Tobiah and Goshen the Arab and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left in it, although up at that time I had not set up the doors in the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent to me saying, Come, let us meet together at Hakafirim in the plain of Ono. But they intended to do me harm. And I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? And they sent to me four times in this way. In the same way, Sanballat for the fifth time sent his servants to me with an open letter in his hand. In it was written, it is reported among the nations and Geshem also says it that you and the Jews intend to rebel that is why you are rebuilding the wall. And according to these reports, you wish to become their king. And you have also set up prophets to proclaim you concerning you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah, and now the king will hear of these reports. So now come and let us take counsel together. Then I sent to him, saying, No such things as you say have been done, for you are, intending, you are inventing them out of your own mind, for they all wanted to frighten us, thinking their hands will drop from the work and it will not be done. But now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. 
So here we are seeing these same guys, Sanballat, Tobiah, and now Ger- Gershom again, the Arabs. So these, these three guys coming together and they've conspired, they've concocted this plan to try to keep the work from being finished. Uh, we would probably call these guys the three amigos, but then that dates me, but it would really date me if I said they were the three stooges, but that's what these three guys, it, 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 when it said that, that trouble seems to come in threes, well, this is Nehemiah's trouble in these three guys. They wanted to distract and intimidate Nehemiah, and, and they used this ruse. Let's meet together. You know what? Let's come together. Let's have some food. Let's have some drink, and let's talk about everything that is going on, and let's meet together. They wanted uh, to talk with Nehemiah so that they could kill him, and they tried this four times inviting him, and every time Nehemiah refuted the invitations. The fifth time, Here comes an open letter from Sanballat, and this is just outright gossip, outright lies about Nehemiah. And he says to Nehemiah, you want to rebuild the wall so the Jews can rebel against the king, and you want to be king yourself in Judah. These things weren't true. Nehemiah says to them, you are making this up as you go. You have invented these things. And, and, And the way they did it was with an open letter, and it's really interesting culturally Uh, This open letter, because we see the same thing goes on today in politics. But uh, here is is Nehemiah saying, where they're telling him, you want to be king. Nehemiah had proven already his character. He wasn't doing this to exalt himself, for him to get ahead. He was doing this for the sake of his brothers, for Jerusalem, for God's people, building these walls for their protection, so that they could once again be a people and have their own place. But... um, Here is this official letter that comes to Nehemiah, and it is an open letter. This is normally a letter was was rolled in a scroll, and then it was sealed with wax, and then whoever the recipient was would get it, and they would open it up, and they would be the first one to read it. But now this letter is open so anybody can see it. So this guy is showing this letter all around the area as he is coming there so everyone can read it. This is an incredible insult to Nehemiah, and it is manipulative by Sanballat. And, and the same goes through to, through to today. This would be the same thing as what we would see in our politics of a leak, a leak. One side wants to further their agenda, so they give a distorted one-sided report or an outright lie, and it's circulated, and it's leaked to the press. Same thing is happening here with this open letter. And this tactic is not new. It it isn't just the first time that they've done this. If you look in Ezra chapter 4, some 80 years earlier when they're building on the temple, they use this exact same tactic then. 80 years earlier, the rulers of Jerusalem, they they use this tactic, and so they stop building on the temple. And it worked then, and now they think maybe it would work again. So they're pulling one out of their old playbook to try and get the work to stop. But the difference between 80 years ago in the book of Ezra and now is one man, Nehemiah. Nehemiah wasn't around then, and Nehemiah is there now. So he is making the difference. He is making the difference. He's not going to fall for these tactics. The enemy has already shown to him what their evil motives are, that they didn't want to help, and they want to kill Nehemiah and somehow stop the work. Let's continue reading in verse number 10 of chapter 6. Now when I went into the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Mehetabel, who was confined to his home, sound familiar to what's going on today? He was confined to his home. He said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. They are coming to kill you by night. But I said, should such a man as I run away? And what man such as I could go into the temple and live? I will not go in. And I understood and saw that God had not sent him, but he had pronounced the prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. For this purpose he was hired, that I should be afraid and act in this way and sin. And so they could give me a bad name in order to taunt me. Remember Tobiah and Sanballat, oh my God, according to these things that they did. And also the prophetess, Noadiah, and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. 
Here is Nehemiah, and this story is, is very, very important at this point because he is very, very close uh, to, to seeing his work all come to nothing and to see the work be stopped and to see the people just scatter. It is very, very close. So, so uh, it, it is amazing here because it is the same thing that happens with us today. You know, our story is what God is doing in us. Your story is what God is doing in you. Nehemiah's story is not so much about Nehemiah. It's not so much about the people of Israel, but it is about what God is doing in them. You know what God has done in us and what God is doing in you now. When we first introduce to God, it is through salvation. It is through the forgiveness and the grace, the mercy of Jesus Christ. And, and Nehemiah, as God's child, as God's man, in this situation, God has already done a work in him and burdened him with the work of going in Jerusalem and repairing the walls. But then there is this enemy that does not want to see God work in Nehemiah's life. There's an enemy that does, that does not want to see God work in our lives. You know, when God saved us and gave us that gift of eternal life, he called us to be his child. But even though we have forgiveness and grace, we have so much more because that is the first step. That is the entrance. So that's when we're born spiritually and we have then the opportunity to grow and to mature. And, and he transforms our life from that moment on, from the inside out. And he begins to make all things new. A very, a very important verse, if you've just come to know the Lord recently, a very important verse that you need to memorize is 2 Corinthians 5.17, which says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, all things become new. So there is that transformation that takes place in our life at salvation, and everything becomes new. And that, that is where we are with Nehemiah. He is, he is someone that is working and living in this land and doing something contrary to what everyone else around him is doing. Nehemiah knew who he was and what God had burdened him with. And I love his response to these guys in verse number 11. Should such a man as I run away. What you're wanting, what you've proposed to me is not what God has, has burdened me with, and God has taken me to a different place, and I'm a different person, and I'm living above my circumstances, and I don't have to do this, and I don't have to be afraid. Nehemiah is refusing to be a coward. Nehemiah understood, if they take me out, who's going to finish the work? If I don't do this, who will do it? So here is Nehemiah. He is recognizing the significance of his position and how showing cowardice as a leader would impact not just the project, but all of the people of Israel. You think about what position you have, who you are, your position in Christ, but also your position here on this earth as a husband, as a mother, as a father. As a wife or a husband, if the enemy takes you out, what will happen to those around you? What will happen to those that are affected by your position? And, and, and Nehemiah says to these guys all throughout this chapter, I will not. The four attacks that come to him, the first one is, he says, I will not be distracted. I'm not going to be distracted. I'm not going to be consumed with coming down to the plane and meeting with you guys. I am busy on the wall, and I am not going to be distracted. The enemy wanted to harm Nehemiah, and they said, let's meet together. And they tried this four times. Can you imagine Nehemiah's frustration? He's sitting there working, and he is laboring, and he's sweating, and he's working really hard. And, and, and here comes this servant, and he knows exactly what he's going to say. Not once, not twice, not three times, but four times they keep coming to him going, Come on, Nehemiah, come down to the plane, and let's take counsel together. Let's meet together. They're, they're like they're wanting to be on his side, but Nehemiah knows that they have evil purposes. You know, people then do the next thing where they invent false rumors and they begin to spread lies. They say things that are not true. And most of these things are indefensible. But Nehemiah just outright says, you have invented these things. What you're accusing me of, that, that Jerusalem wants to rebel, the Israel wants to rebel against the king, and that I want to set myself up as king of Judah, that is not what is going on. That is not what we're about. 
And you know, when people say things like that, they, they invent those things. They say things that are not true, or they think they're true, or they want them to be true. And then there's always other people that will repeat those things. So this was gossip that had gotten to Nehemiah, and it had spread like wildfire. You know, we are always quick to believe a wrong about someone. And then we always have to repeat it. Like we have insider knowledge about someone, and we repeat that. And then there are always those people who would, will willingly believe false rumors. Nehemiah said, I will not be distracted. And he says, I will not be discouraged. Being falsely accused, having his motives questions. So these false rumors, these things that are being tr- invented and said about him, he says, I'm not going to be discouraged by this. It doesn't matter what the people think because I know who I am. I know whose I am. And I am going to accomplish what God had set out for me to do. So he says, I'm not going to be distract- distracted or discouraged And thirdly, he says, I'm not going to be fooled. This guy says, hey, why don't you come into the temple? Now, the temple was right there. So it was like this was coming from the inside, from God's people. Come into the temple, and let's meet together, and let's worship in there. And we'll close the doors on the temple, and you'll be protected because they're going to come and kill you, and they're going to come this very night if you don't hurry up and get here inside of the temple. But Nehemiah says, God didn't send him. I discerned that it, it, was not, it was not what God had, was doing, and God was not delivering me. This was the evil that they had hired this guy to get me to come in. And you know, evil is often disguised as good, the good things in our life. And this is what we're always quick to do, is to jump into good things. And it's easy for Satan to use those things to distract us. Good things. The, the, the scripture says that even uh, Satan disguises himself as an angel of light so that these good things to try and pull us away and, and do us harm. You know, deception is alive and well. We have to be discerning as God's people. We have to recognize what is truly of God and what is not of God. And all good things come to us, and and, and, I mean, all bad things come to us disguised as good things. Do you know what truth is? Do you know how to discern truth? And, and, And it says, Nehemiah knew this full well, and he said, God didn't send you. God didn't send you. And then the last thing, which I think is very, very important that Nehemiah does. This is very, very interesting. He says, I will not be labeled by sin. You're not going to put that tag on me. You're not going to use this this, uh, deception and this sin on me. Get me to sin so that the enemies can taunt me and say, see, you're no different than anybody else. You see, you say you're God's person, but you're, you're doing what everybody else did. You are quickly to, drawn away, and, and you are not doing what God wants you to do. And so you're no different than anyone else. He says, for this purpose was he hired, that I should be afraid and act in this way and sin. And so they could give me a bad name in order to taunt me. Do you understand, Christian, that we live in a hostile world, the world that we are called to love? To, to care for, to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is a hostile world. And, and Satan wants nothing more than to label us and, and so that we can be taunted and we can be made fun of. And they didn't just want to taunt Nehemiah and make fun of him. They wanted to make fun of his God. They wanted to make fun of what he was doing, what he was burdened with. You know, sin wants to claim every one of us, even God's children. Sin wants to claim us and label us. It wants to entrap us and get us to believe lies about ourselves. Sin wants you to believe that label about yourself and then live it and hold you back. And, and even in this guy, in this case where he says, confine you to your home, I was confined in my home. This is the same thing where we're talking about with being quarantined. That's what the labels of sin do. They quarantine us. They hold us back. They, they frighten us into corners and to keep us from doing what God wants us to do. There's an interesting thing. I don't know if you follow the Trustful Tribune 
online, but our local newspaper. Every week now they post the pictures of those that have been arrested and are being accused of shoplifting. They post their picture and their name. It, it is absolutely amazing that they can do this and that they do this. And, and so there, there's this label that's going on. Now, they don't have to be uh, um, guilty to be on there, but they're being labeled with this. Probably they were caught, and there's enough evidence they will be prosecuted. But these labels stick with us. Sin is, is, is a, a nasty, uh, it, is, it, it stinks, and it, when it gets on us, it stays around us. You know, you don't have to be a skunk to stink. You just have to be around the skunk. And you will stink. And you carry that, that uh, sin with you wherever you go. That's what they wanted to do to Nehemiah. They wanted to pull him down to their level. They wanted him to be what they were and, and be evil and not do anything and be opposed to God. But the labels of sin, they come, come upon every one of us if we're not careful. Whether it be a thief or a drunk or an addict or a sex offender or or even other things where we come from our sin nature, where we feel unloved. That's what Satan wants to label us with. You're not worth loving. You're worthless. You're a loser. You're no good. You're unwanted. You're a nobody. You're not significant. That's what Satan wants to imprint upon us. These same things that, that, to draw us away from what God has done in us and what God is doing in us. You know what? God's labels are the best labels you could possibly have, where we are loved, where he loved us even when we were in the middle of our sin, even in the middle when we were stinking and and even dead in our trespasses and sins, the scripture says. He loves us. He cherishes us. Forgiven is is an incredible label that God has given to us. Redeemed, justified, which is an incredible legal term used throughout the book of Romans, which just means it is as if you have never sinned, as if you've never done those things. I have justified you through my son, Jesus Christ. And then that beautiful process word of sanctification, the process of sanctified being transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And then there's the heirs to the promise. And then there is the new creation that we talked about. And the holy that God has proclaimed us as holy. His sons and daughters of God called, chosen. And here's one that that fits right in with this idea of building, renewing, restoring what Nehemiah is doing in the the walls of, of Jerusalem. This label of God's workmanship. We are God's workmanship, God working in us. You know, our story, your story, our story, for those of us that know Jesus Christ, is what God has done and what he is doing in us. That is our story. Ephesians chapter 2, which, which uh, Ryan began this morning in the introduction, it, it goes on to say this in verse number 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith. So this is God's part where God just bestows upon us salvation, grace. He doesn't give us what we deserve. He gives us what his son has has given to us through the the death and his burial on the on the cross. So we have that grace that we have been saved and through faith. And this is not your doing, it is a gift of God. It isn't something you can earn, it isn't something that you can be uh, qualified to do. All you have to do is believe and and accept it and repent. So it is a gift of God, not a result of works that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So there is this idea in these two verses of us having salvation through Jesus Christ, and then through Jesus Christ we are his workmanship, and he continues to work in us for good works, and that we should walk in those works, and God continue to transform our story and the lives of those around us and their story. So we see this story here of what God is doing through you. We see what God is doing through Nehemiah and what God accomplishes through Nehemiah. What once was is no more. Where there was uh, fire and destruction and the temple walls were completely destroyed and the work was so great and the enemy was so powerful around them, those things are are all done. And here they are walking up around these walls and they're admiring them and they're looking at what God has done. Go back to Nehemiah chapter 6. 
in verse number 15. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month of Elul. In the 52 days, it was finished. And when all our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and fell greatly in their own esteem. For they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. Moreover, in these days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah, and Tobiah's letters came to them. For many in Judah were bound by oath to him, because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Era, and his son Jehoan, and had taken the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, as his wife. Also they spoke of his good deeds in my presence, and reported my words to him. And Tobiah sent letters to make me afraid. Now we're seeing the enemy in the death throes of defeat. Hear what they were wanting to do in Nehemiah and make him afraid. Now they are in turn afraid because Nehemiah stayed true to the calling that was before him. He stayed true to the task that was before him. We see Nehemiah with resolve and dedication. And this resolve and dedication brings about success. In verse 15, when it says that they had finished the walls in 52 days, they had rebuilt up the walls. This is six months it took for them to rebuild the walls. This is an engineering miracle. But they didn't do it just in their own strength. They did it in God's strength. And then in verse number 16, one of the greatest results that I love about this, because I love for Nehemiah finally to be getting some retribution and some revenge and some, some things that for the people of Israel, a victory here. Their enemies were afraid, and it says that they were so depressed and so, down, so downcast. You see, people knew that God had done something miraculous. They were giving credit to the, the, not the people of Israel, but to the God of Israel. The work had been accomplished with the help of our God. You know, God's people live life on purpose. We live life on purpose, and we live according to his purpose. That's what we see in this story through Nehemiah. He wasn't going to be distracted. He wasn't going to be discouraged. He wasn't going to be fooled, and he wasn't going to be labeled, which the world wanted to do to him. He lived his life for the purpose of God. The first thing, if you want to live your life in a purpose for God, is allow God to finish things in your life, the things that he brings you to. Finish those things. Finish those things. See, through, see it through to the end. Don't give up. Don't walk away. Don't, don't have attention deficit disorder and think, well, this is too hard. I'm going to go do something else. I'm going to give up on this. It, it, the task looks too big. I'm going to go somewhere else. You know, that is Christianity today is join what's already been done and take a victory in that what has already been done. And you have no skin in the game. You have no sacrifice in the game. God has not used you in any way to accomplish that. We want to just flock to where there is already a finished wall and, and walk around like we helped with it. But here we got things that God calls to us, burdens us with, finish those things. If we continuously look for the next big thing, we are going to miss the biggest thing, the biggest thing. Scripture warns new believers in Ephesians chapter 4. He tells them that when you begin your spiritual walk, be careful about the next big thing. Allow God to finish his work in you. He says this in Ephesians chapter 4. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Remember how we talked about earlier that sometimes bad things are cloaked in good things? For the Christian, the easiest way to distract us is to paint something as the next big thing. The next big thing that you've discovered, the next big thing that you never knew about God and what he wants to show you. You know, you can't be proud of what you do if you never finish anything. If you never finish anything. What does it take to finish something? There is an incredible lie that goes out, and I see it in young people. I see it in, in my own children. I see it in other people. Um, 
And, and, and I just see it in culture in general, this lie that is like a blanket that is being thrown over the minds of young people. You know, when you see someone that is YouTube famous or someone who is an internet sensation, I mean, we're always looking for that exposure there. But let me tell you this, that this lie is, is this incredible uh, dupe. It, it, it will fool you. And it is this, that exposure replaces achievement. You don't have to achieve anything. You don't have to be anything. If you have the exposure, then you're successful. Exposure has replaced achievement. The number one goal of young people today, if you ask them, they say this, I want to be famous. I want to be famous. But they have no idea what they want to be famous for. I just want to be famous. I don't care what it's for. Exposure has replaced achievement. I want to have a record deal. But I don't practice music. I'm not learning. I'm not, I'm not uh, submitting myself to practice and, and having a tutor, a mentor over me or a teacher over me. I want to be in movies, but you never act. You never go out there and, and, and get involved in that way. You don't research that industry. I want to have a lot of money, but I don't want to learn a skill that would give me the opportunity to make money. I don't want to put in the work and the effort and the dedication. Oh, no, that's going to take too long. I just want this, and I want it now. You see, exposure has replaced achievement. I'm so glad that Nehemiah did not choose exposure. He chose achievement. I am going to finish this wall. You know, anybody can start, but only a few people can finish. Most people have so many projects they've started in their life. They're so cluttered up with those things. And it is the same thing with God. We can jump, jump from one thing to another and never accomplish anything and finish anything. Nehemiah is included in the word of God because he built a wall. He finished what he set out to do. He finished what God burdened him with. And this is the, the biggest return on that investment is that he made God famous. He made God famous to all those people that hated God, to all those people that hated their God, that hated Nehemiah and the children of Israel. It's, and and they, they made God famous. What we can do versus what we can do with the help of God. It's difficult for God to get the credit if we're always wanting the credit. The credit was God's and it was His alone. And all the people knew it. All the enemies knew that God had done this thing. But even though God got the credit, this was decided through the people of God's having hard work and they rejected the continuous distractions that were thrown at them. So this morning, I want us to go back to God writing our story. As we read the story of Nehemiah, it is, it is a bestseller reading as we read through what God's doing and the, the twists and the turns and when it looks like they're down and out and, and yet here they come back as strong as ever. We're looking at the story of Nehemiah. It is also a reflection of our own story and God writing our story. Your story never ends. It is forever. As God's child, you are eternal. You've been granted eternal life. Don't be distracted by the temporary things that would keep you from fulfilling your eternal purpose. Stay focused. Don't leave the wall. Keep building. Trust in God as Nehemiah did and not in your circumstances. Evaluate in your life, is it more defined by the labels of sin or is it more defined by the labels that God has given to you? You'll know by what you're doing. You'll know by what acts you're doing, what works you're doing. If those labels, you believe in the labels of the world or if you're believing the labels of God. Nehemiah refused to be afraid. Through threats and insults, temptations to sin, he said, I will not, I will not, I will not. Nehemiah did something that gave God the credit and made the entire world and all of the enemies tremble in fear. I want to leave you with this thought. People who make an eternal difference work for an eternal purpose. And that only comes from what God has done in us and what God does through us. If God has saved you, he's, doing, he's done something in you. 
and you have a greater purpose. This morning, if God has worked in your life, if God has prompted you something about in your mind, in your heart, he's, he's, he's evaluated or he's thrown out something in your life that, that you need to really uh, look at and reject, I encourage you to go to the website of Argo Christian Fellowship. And there's a button on there that says, My Response Today. I would love to hear from you and what God is doing in your story. Write those things out. Uh, uh, send that to me so that I can pray for you. And I can know that the, there is a God in heaven and we can give God the credit together. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Our gracious Father, we are thankful that you love us and you care for us. And that you help us through the distractions of our circumstances and the distractions of this world. Lord, I pray that you would work in each of the people's lives that are watching today. Lord, I pray that they would understand their position and they would understand the, the significance of their position, that Satan would like nothing more than to take them out and to knock them off. I pray, Father, that they would live lives that do not compromise, that they live their life with resolve and dedication to what you have outlined in your word, that they strive to be your child and to live up to that title. God, they would live up to the labels that you've placed on them and not the labels of the world. They wouldn't listen to that inner voice of our, of our sin or human nature that tells us that we're not wanted or that we're not good enough or that we can't accomplish that, that want to make us afraid and, and make us cower in a corner somewhere. Lord, that you'd make us bold and courageous because we are your people. We are your children. We're children of the King. Thank you, Lord, for loving us and caring for us through your Son, Jesus Christ. I pray these things now in his name. Amen. The dark tried to hide you and steal you away. Death tried to keep you inside of the grave The enemy fought you and he tried but he lost But you cannot be silenced When we cried for freedom you tore down the
Church will see you next Sunday.